please join me in a very warm welcome for Dr. Helen Chersky. In your book, you present the oceans and really our whole world as this sort of beautiful mechanical-esque system. Um, and you talk about currents and layers in the water and about sea creatures and even entire cultures. Uh, it's this really interesting framing. And how did you first start to see the world as this blue machine? Um, well, it, it came to me by accident because I, you know, I, as you said, I'm trained as a physicist and I did a PhD in some other area of physics. I didn't want to continue with that, so I spent um, six months reading, I don't know, copies of Scientific American and Nature, looking for another field of science. And I found bubbles, okay, bubbles sound interesting. And, and doing bubbles took me to the Scripps Institution of Oceanography with no idea what the ocean was. And, uh, you know, I just went as a postdoc and I understood that lab, right? It had tanks and pipes and oscilloscopes and, you know, stuff I could do things with. And then there was this great big frame by the door, kind of two metres high and two metres on each side. And it had stuff on it and it was just sitting by these big doors and I didn't really pay any attention. And so there were three weeks of thinking I understood what was going on. And then one day I watched everyone else and everyone else was kind of fussing over this, didn't pay any attention. Um, one day they opened these big doors and they carried this thing out to the ocean because Scripps is right on the ocean and they put it in the waves and I realised it was their gateway to another world. And then I was like, hang on a minute, nobody told me about this. I was that kid that read all the books and read New Scientist and read all the things. And nobody talked to me about the ocean. And yet, um, as a physicist, as soon as, as, soon as it was the, the idea, there was the idea to look at it, it was obvious that this was the most important thing on the planet. And I was so indignant that no one had said anything. Um, and so, so that was how I got into it. And then I, you know, I was at Scripps and then, then I was just like going around with big eyes and flapping ears and trying to learn um, and catch up on all this stuff that these oceanographers knew but somehow was not getting out into the world. But once you see that the ocean is about physics predominantly, the biology is part of it, fish are very nice, but they're a part of an engine, they're a living part of an engine. And once you see it like that, it, it, it's, it's so much more interesting, and, but it really gives you a way into the way Earth ticks. Yeah, and you were mentioning that you were sort of indignant that kind of no one has mentioned the ocean. Why do you think that that is something that's kind of overlooked or, or not really talked about? Yeah, well, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? Because we went, you know, the Apollo missions uh, in, you know, 1968, 72 were the last time that human, human eyes were far enough away to see the whole planet. And, you know, here at Google, you do great things with Google Earth and all that kind of thing, but it's not the same as human eyes really seeing it. So that, those famous pictures, um, Earthrise and uh, the blue marble, that was humanity really seeing itself, and we haven't been back. You know, the next few years we might go back, but um, so. But it was obvious it was blue. Everyone said, "Oh, we live on a blue planet, hooray!" Um, and what was interesting is that for 50 years we talked about, we used the phrase "a blue planet" without ever interrogating that blue, and it is an extraordinary act of blindness. And I think it's it's true for several reasons. One of them is it's just you know we're land mammals. We hang about on the edges. We can't see it unless you're like me and you get to go out to ships on uh, you know to get to go far out to sea. You're not really confronted with how big it is, um, and it's far away and we can't go in it. There are a couple of specific things. So that the great tragedy of the ocean, the thing that defines how it works, but also its great tragedy from a human point of view, is that light doesn't travel very far through it. So it gets absorbed within a couple of hundred meters. So what that means is that everything below a couple of hundred meters is completely black. And so what, what that means is that, you know, when you think about what came from the moon missions or what comes from expeditions to Antarctica, it's photographs. It's photographs of massive, great big vistas. And then our little visually focused brains go, oh, that's great. There's, here it is. And you can't do that in the ocean. And that's the, the thing more than anything else that stops us seeing the ocean as a place is that not only we, can we not see into it, but we can't see any of the things that are happening in it. So it's just out of sight, out of mind. And, um, and, the, and the other reason is that it's kind of hard because it's, it does things that are very big and very small and very fast and very slow. And it does all these different, you know, it matters because of culture and because of animals and, you know. So I think a lot of it is that it's like the three blind men and the elephant, you know, that ancient parable where three blind men somehow find an elephant. Uh, as you do, and, and one of them puts out his hand and touches the trunk and says, oh, an elephant's like a snake, and one touches the leg and says, oh, an elephant is like a tree trunk. And the thing is, they're all true, but they're all partial truths. And so I think, really, when we're presented with a bit of the ocean, it's only ever a partial truth. And, and the great privilege of writing a book, of course, is that what you can do is you can just jump about between stories, and but focus on showing the shape. 
so that you've, you've got enough partial truths in there that you start to get a picture of what's really going on. And so I think it's just that popular culture has never done that. They've got so focused on pretty fish, basically, that one perspective, that you would think that nothing else about the ocean matters. And it's only just started to change, actually, because of the um, ocean uh, temperature, the, you know, hot heat sort of... Um, ocean heating and heat waves and all that kind of thing and suddenly people are like oh the ocean's got a temperature and there's this you know and that's the f that's the first thing that's the first time i remember anyone discussing the physics of the ocean really apart from the biology yeah that makes sense and you were talking there about how humans are visual creatures and that kind of is a limitation in the ocean but when you're thinking about the sort of blue machine as you call it what is it that you're like picturing what's the visual that you have in your mind well, the, I mean, the beauty of it is it's all these things. So <laughs> there's a kind of, no, the coughing's going to start. The big picture, which is that, um, you know, this is a layered structure, that it's, the layers are set by density, by temperature and salinity, that it's not all mixed up. That's really important. It's too big to get mixed up really quickly. There just isn't enough energy around, basically, to do it. So you get these components that have quite different characteristics, and they're, they're, they're moving around each other. They're shunting around. They're moving stuff around the planet. So there's all of that. There's that kind of big engine type stuff. Um, and, but, but then if you look in a bit closer, you see something different. And if you look in closer, you, you see something different again. So, and, the th they, and they all matter. Like the things that, you know, most of life in the ocean is really tiny. It's mostly single cells or 65-ish 60, percent of the life in the ocean we can't see with the naked eye, which is probably just as well because that's the only bit, that's the bit we have damage least. You know, because as soon as we can see it, we start going, oh, maybe we'll take that out. Um, and, you know, so, so it's in a way that bit's been kind of been protected because we can't see it. Um, so if you zoom right in, what you see is this soup of life and, and, you know, chemicals and atoms and molecules being exchanged and this kind of busy little, um, it, it's, it, things are shunting around all of the time as life gets on with it but it works differently slightly in different places. And so you zoom right in, you see that, and you zoom right out, and you see these big things, and then you look at how animals are navigating through this structure, that it's not the same everywhere, that they are, they are it's, it's not just like, oh, tuna goes, today I think I'll cross the Atlantic Ocean. You know, that's not really how it works. It, uh, quite often, if you look at where they're going, fine, they might be doing it instinctively, but they're, look, they're going because the ocean is predictable. There are these features, and they know they will find these features, and they know that those physical features, I mean, you know, no, but they know that that is where they'll find food because the physical, the physics of the ocean promote, provides the environment for life. And so, there's, so, that, so when I look at the ocean, it's, it's like um, the joy of it is that it looks differently depending on how you look. So it's endlessly entertaining. Yeah. Yeah, and you also talk about how you know you can zoom in and you can zoom out and you can see all of these different views, but then there is the uh, sort of human component and how on the biggest scale it's influenced human civilizations and human cultures. Why was it, or what about that aspect of it was something that you noted as being important to the story that you wanted to tell? Because humans are very self-centered, <laughs> <laughs> fundamentally. <laughs> like the other reason that people haven't really written about the ocean is because the, you, one of those perspectives is that it's water and more water. Some more other water, different water. You know, humans are not very interested in water, but if you tell them why the water matters, they become a bit more interested. So, so that you know, you know, the, the, that's why the stories in the book are they're interesting stories in their own right. But they show how the movement of the components and the way the engine turns, um, they sort of tell what how that happens at the same time as telling how it matters. And so, um, yeah. So, so when it comes to how civilizations depend on it, it's it's. It's the background to everything that we do, it, or the what you know. So, so telling the stories in a way that matters to humans, it, it tells you it's something you can't take for granted. Basically, I think a lot of people, you know, it sometimes drives me nuts. There are those stories um, that on the news one day. They'll be, oh, and today there's loads of jellyfish off Cornwall. Like jellyfish just decide, you know, someone rolls a dice today, it's jellyfish. Tomorrow it'll be clarinets, and and of course it's not like that. It's because the ocean engine has turned underneath and there's been a confluence of conditions, and then you've got the conditions for jellyfish, and then you've probably got lots of jellyfish. But we talk about it as though it's like, oh, well, today there's jellyfish. And, and it's that, I think we just, we sort of, um, we just assume it's magic, basically, that it does, it does funny things, fine, today it's jellyfish, and, and, we, and we don't push in, really, and say, and have an idea that there's, there's something going on that we can't see. There's a three-dimensional engine underneath, and we're only seeing the top surface of it.
Yeah, and from that perspective, how much of this system do we understand and how much is stuff that we're still kind of figuring out and, and digging into? Right, so there's two answers to that question, but well, I'm going to have my rant at this point. I have a rant. I have many, but this one is the one which is, um, bugs me the most, which is there's that horrible phrase. People say that we know more about the surface of the moon than we do about the deep sea. And if you leave this room with one thing, never say that ever again. It is most fundamentally and deeply wrong and misleading and damaging thing. Just make it go away, people of Google. Make this go away. <laughs> Um, and, and the reason it's misleading is, is firstly, that it's, it's, I mean, it comes from a grain of truth. All these things come from a grain of truth, which is that um, th at some point, and it might some, in some sense it might still be true, that somebody worked out that we had mapped the, the shape of the, the moon, the moon's surface, to a greater re re um, resolution than we had mapped all of the surface, the shape of the deep ocean. But first of all, that assumes that shape is the only thing that matters. Um, and there's a whole history of discovery, which you know, Western explorers come and they park their flag and they draw their map and they clear off back home to the king and get loads of gold, right? They, they drew their map, that's what everyone wanted. Um, so, but also, you know, the ocean is doing things. It's three dimensional, it's got all this life, it's got geology, it changes with the seasons, it's got processes going on all the time. The moon has literally not changed in two billion years. It's very nice. I don't mind the moon, it's very nice, but it has, it's, not, it's not doing anything. And so there is so much more to know about the ocean. And, and my beef with that phrase is fundamentally that when you say it, it makes it sound like the deep ocean and the moon are comparable, that the deep ocean is equivalent to a dead rock that hasn't changed for two billion years, doesn't do anything. Um, and, and that, and that it's, it's fundamentally misleading. So it's true that there's a lot, I often get asked, you know, what. Everyone, everyone likes mysteries, that's the other thing. They like to know there's something we don't know. Humans love it if there's a great big mystery about something. Um, so, so in some sense, people like thinking of it as a mystery. But actually, the more exciting bit is the, the, the sort of what's going on. It's like nested mysteries inside mysteries. So we do know a lot about the ocean. We know a lot more about it than the moon. You know, 12 men went to the moon 50 years ago with a computer that, you know, uh, you lot here could probably design on a pinhead now, and and lots. Of, like, but people have spent all of those intervening intervening years and lots of the ones before studying the ocean. We've been in it. We've dropped things through it. We've taken samples from it. We've studied the life in it. We've watched it change. There's loads of stuff we know about the ocean, but there are some. It's like all these things. There are the further down you go, the more you discover, right? No one says medicine should stop because we discovered where our kidneys are, right? Take that box job done, let's all go home. Of course it gets more interesting the deeper you look. And so um, we do have the big picture of the ocean. We do know what it looks like. Um, we do know the fundamental principles on which it operates. We do know the principles that you know allow life to live. Um, and we can see how the structure of the ocean changes that. But we don't know all the details of how it functions now. Because the thing about the, an ocean, a liquid engine, is that it is an engine. It's something that converts uh, energy, heat energy, into movement. That's what engines do. Um, but it can operate differently depending on the configuration of the planet. Right? It, it's interesting because the land gets in the way. And so you get these ocean basins, and you get squiggly bits of coastlines, and you get sticky out bits, and that all makes the ocean interesting. And so the exact details of all the subtleties that come from the way the ocean works today we're still figuring some of those out. And we know that the ocean used to work differently in the past. So the principles were the same, but the outcome was different. So, so it, it's, um, there's always more to know. And we don't know, near, you know, we don't know enough about the ocean. I think I will agree to that. Yeah, and sticking on that moon point, it, it seems like some of the most exciting aspects of you know, moon exploration comes from humans going, as opposed to like sending robots or probes or whatever it is. Is that? Also, something that we see with ocean science and like research is there something where we kind of want a human in the story? Yeah, I mean, m the people went to the moon to look back at Earth. That was the major benefit. But so uh, w with the ocean, it's interesting, and it's actually a very interesting current topic because there is no doubt that you can get a robot to do things that you wouldn't get a human to do, like stay for sixty hours, look in the same spot, looking at the same thing, um, for ethical or practical reasons. Um, and so, and also you can lose, you know, if you lose one in a thousand robots, you don't really care. If you lose one in a thousand humans, you, you really care a lot, or you should. So it's very difficult to take humans into the deep ocean safely. It's not too difficult to do it. Hundreds of people have gone. 
but it's too difficult and expensive to do for all of us to do it on a regular basis. You know, if you're a billionaire, you've bought your little submarine, you can play that game. Um, but um, but actually, there's a more there's a more serious side of that now, which is that we ocean scientists are obviously very aware of the carbon footprint of what we do, and so the the big debate that's coming up in ocean oceanography now is is how much we don't just get robots because they can do things, but we get robots because they might be more carbon efficient. And the problem with that, I mean, and of course, you know, these tools are great, more information is great. My problem with it is that if you just do that, you take away humanity's relationship with the ocean. It begins to become a computer game. And that's when you've really lost the battle. That's when you not only lose the richness of having the ocean, you also can't do your science as well. I mean, there's no question that if you look at PhD theses written by people who went to sea and got their own data and by people who analyzed data that was collected by remote means. I mean, th they, they've got completely different sort of fundamental assumptions. And a lot of it's because the people who went to sea have been humbled by it. And of course, not everyone can go to sea. And it's not that everyone should go to sea um, or that we should force them to. But I think it's really important that some people go and some people bring that experience back into their ocean science. Um, and basically, you know, I'm an experimentalist. I think the theorists need to be brought back down to earth with a bump quite a lot of the time. I am totally fed up with theoretical computational scientists who are very nice, bright people generally, telling me that my job is to validate their models. That is not true. That is not what experimentalists are for. My job is to go out and look at the way the physical world, the natural world really is. It's your job to explain it. If you want to, you know, if you can make a model that predicts that, good for you. Um, to test our understanding and to make predictions for the future. But it's not my job to make your model look good. My job is to measure reality, and your job is to try and copy some of that. <laughs> you know, so, so, so there are these questions about, you know, if you just send the robots, and of course you're only measuring the things that you thought you were going to measure, and you don't see what was happening, you don't see that there was a whale alongside at the same time, or you don't see that something else weird was happening, and you miss the richness of observation. And so, um, so, yeah, so, so I think this, this future question of how we, because at the moment you can't build research big enough, be a research ship big enough. So I'm about to go to sea in November and December for five weeks to do one of the very rare, it's one of the very rare times we get to do a big ocean breathing experiment. We need to be on, a, I think this ship's 120 metres long. It probably burns $30,000 worth of fuel a day when it's steaming. It's a, lot of, it's a lot of carbon. But we have no other way to get there. We have no other way to get this data on which climate models depend. And so, you know, how, and, and there's no prospect of a ship being able to do that for another 30 years, basically, at the moment. So, you know, so these questions of, there is a carbon cost to that human relationship at the moment. Or maybe there are other ways to do it. Maybe you just teach everyone to sail. So, so it's a, I know you asked a relatively simple question, but actually it goes quite deep into how we choose to have a relationship with the ocean and do we want our scientists to be studying something which is basically just a computer game or do we want them to be studying it because it's part of their lived experience and they've got more respect for it because of that yeah definitely um and there's also sort of this element of um like intuition i know when people think about physics often the thing that comes to mind is you know quantum physics and these things that are inherently unintuitive and, and they don't match our lived experience but with ocean science, um, there's like peoples and whole cultures that have you know centuries of intuition built up about how the system works and how you know different creatures work. How important is that, like intuition in ocean science? So the example, I guess, of you know the the, uh, the ocean, the Earth has got one ocean civilization. It's, it's Polynesia, uh, the the biggest one that they navigated between their islands uh, across thousands of kilometers of ocean without. GPS or magnets, you know, compasses, anything like that. They did it using observation. Um, and they say a lot of it is intuitive and it's a mixture. Like they learn, they have to learn a lot of things that we would call technical things and a framework for thinking about it. But then they actually do a lot of it based on intuition when the human brain is kind of putting together the logic without it going through conscious thought. And so the way they see the ocean is, um, is very different because they're doing it for a different reason. That some of it, the way they see the ocean now is for cultural reasons. It's because of its, it's part of their identity. And those people are not anti-science. It's just that they think that the, the two things go alongside each other, right? Science lets us understand the ocean in this way, and the cultural 
intuitive thing lets us understand it in this way. And there is no doubt that they are superb at observation, better almost certainly than any Western scientist. Because when your life depends on it and you're in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, you better be really good at it, right? You're, you're tuned in, every single sense you have is tuned into that one task in ways you're not even aware of. So I don't think there's any doubt that their observation is much better. Um, but the real power comes from combining those two, from having a bit of both. Because I think if you, it's not so much that intuition, you know, intuition can sometimes, it's your, it's your subconscious connecting two ideas, to connecting two observations and going, oh, well, maybe it's that. And so sometimes I think intuition is, it's, it is a logical process somewhere down inside. It's just you don't know when it's logical and you don't know when it's based on real things or when it's on based on something your brain's made up. So you still have to test it. You still have to test the science. But I think that what intuition allows you is to recognise that we are human. We are human scientists. We are human beings living on this planet. We are not robots who are just measured by the efficiency of how, you know, the, the amount of coffee it takes to turn into a piece of computer code, right? I mean, I, I hope none of you live your lives like that. Uh, I certainly don't. There's much more to life than efficiency by whatever measure you pick. And so part of the intuition is appreciation. It's like the richness of living is involved in observing and appreciating all of these things. And then that gives your science meaning. And that means you will probably do your science better. And so it's that way of thinking about it. And of course, having respect for different perspectives. I mean, it doesn't matter where good ideas come from. If they, if they work, then let's all share them. So um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, there we are human beings who do science. And that's why science is interesting. Yeah. Is the way that we do like ocean science, you were talking about how you know there's this strong case for potentially trying to use robots and things as we are m increasingly concerned about carbon footprint. Does that change? the fact that um, you know, we're maybe losing that sense of intuition or we're maybe um, you know, replacing it with a tool that's a bit different than, than a human brain? So um, I've just been having a discussion about sustainability and engineering. And, and somebody said to me in that context, they said, an engineer is always optimizing. You've just got to ask what they're optimizing towards. Um, and I think, I, I think it's about that. It's about that you've got to, you've got to choose how you are do you remind me how you phrase the question? I've had a yeah, I guess it's kind of when when we're doing science as you know a human that's experiencing the ocean in some way. Maybe they're out on a ship as opposed to a robot being there. Where if we're continuously using tools and and replacing our experience, are we then losing something in the long term about you know uh, we've replaced our ability to walk around a city with Google Maps' ability to walk around the city? So yeah, so the point is, if you think it's all about where I was going, is if you think it's all about the optimization, you've lost your humanity. And so optimization is a tool, and it should be a tool in service of humanity, not something that dictates what humanity is. And so, and I think it's the same in the ocean that you know, optimizing. If you need a robot that is going to go down to two kilometers depth and scoot around a bit and come up, you optimize it to do that task, right? That is absolutely fair. But it is doing that task in service of something bigger. And that's the bit that matters. I th and I think what happens with the, what's happening with the carbon and the robots debate is that, you know, the sort of simplistic view is if you, you, what they did is they said to a load of engineers, we want to be carbon neutral. And the engineers went, okay, we've got some ideas for being carbon neutral. Here it is, get rid of the humans. And I'm sort of, you know, simplifying the way this went, but it's not far off. And so the problem is if you optimize for carbon efficiency, you and you forget that there are there's a whole load of human considerations in there then you've missed you missed the point and i think this is the game i mean i see it a lot teaching engineering that engineers like to be set a task and here are my here are my uh, goals here's what i'm optimizing to here's my measures for success this is my task and the problem is you can do that like as a, as, a, as a confined task, but at some point, someone's got to zoom out and say, well, now you've done it. Does it actually fit the bigger picture? And, and, I, and my student engineers really struggle with that. I think that they, some of them do, I think they really like the idea that you can, I mean, it's a nice, comfortable place, isn't it? Here's my job. I've done my job. Tick my box. I can stop thinking now. I've done, I can be happy because I've done my thing. And th it comes as a real shock to them that the rest of the world's complicated. And they're like, I don't want to know about your complications. I've had students come to me say, you know, I came here to do equations, not to write essays. 
I'm like, sorry, kiddo, <laughs> you know, <laughs> meet the real world. Um, so, so I, you know, but it, it shouldn't be something to be afraid of. And it, the problem is it adds, co it adds, it adds complication instead of, you know, and it, there's a comfort in things being simple, but it's okay to, to sort of embrace the complication a bit. Yeah. Yeah, and with climate change kind of being this sort of existential, almost answer to the question of why are we doing this, does that, do you see that coming through in like students each year? Or is it kind of filtering further down with younger and younger generations or not so much? Um, it's hard to tell I, for me. So I think in general, they are much more aware of it. I mean, we see the evidence for that and all this discussion of, uh, you know, I can't remember all the words for it, but things like quiet quitting and the idea that, you know, that they've sort of, a lot, some of the younger generation have got to the point where they're like, well, we don't know what's going on. We don't think we're ever really going to get a job. All this, you know, shiny future that you promise us if we work hard is not going to happen, so we might as well just have a good time. You know, live for today almost. And, and the world has done that to them. But in, in, my, in my department, I, I see an awareness, but they don't know how to think about it. Like, we're, we're, we, we don't talk about values very much in our society. It's really interesting. We talk about numbers you know numbers have to be important and everyone says follow the science and the science doesn't tell you what to do i mean you all know this right the science tells you if you want to get there it can help you decide what direction to go in but it's your values that tell you what to do and we're not very good about talking about values and so um if we got better at that and i think this is what i see with the student engineers that they're, they're starting to think about values so we're starting to have the discussion about values and it, you know, whatever your values are, you should you should know. You should have done some thinking about it, and then you can do your engineering to fit those values. So, it, so I think it is they're becoming more accepting of it over time. But it's um, it, and it's hard to tell in my department because they come in all car focused. I'm like, really, you know, I had some first years just last week or the week before tutees. Well, what do you want to do? I don't want to build Formula One cars. I'm like, really, okay. <laughs> I know, we're going to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, I think changing gears a little bit, one of the major ways that people sort of interface with the ocean is through the food that they eat. And given the challenges with overfishing and the myriad problems with aquaculture, how should people be thinking about their relationship with fish as food? It's a, it's a thorny ethical topic because, first of all, um, you know, I think it's something like 12% of the world's protein comes from fish at the moment. And that is especially important in poor communities where it's their only source of protein. You know, if you live on the coast in a dry place, you don't have land mammals. Fish is what you've got. Um, so I think that there needs to be some subtlety in this because um, those communities are generally not the ones causing the problem. The problem is industrial fishing that is done out at sea. I highly recommend a book called uh, Outlaw Ocean by Ian Urbana that talks about uh, lots of unlawful things that happen on the high seas. Well, they're not unlawful because there's no law against them out there, but you know, th they would be unlawful in lots of other places. Um, it's the way we do it. So it's not, so it's, it's industrial fishing. And there is, by the way, a thing called fish laundering, which is a, a great and terrible phrase at the same time. So about, I, think, I think the statistic is 20% of all fish are laundered which basically means they're caught in some illegal fashion and then they've been in, uh, through enough markets and whatever that by the time they pop out into wherever they pop out into, they look respectable. It's just like money laundering, but with fish. So I think it's difficult for consumers to decide what to do. In our society, um, you know, here in the UK anyway, um, we, it's relatively hard to know where your fish is coming from. So I think if you eat fish from local fishermen and you know how it's been caught, you know, that's all great. There are sustainable fish guides um, so that the, um, that is, you know, I think if you're going to eat fish, that, that's, I don't, but um, if you're going to eat fish, that's, that, that helps you find the better ones. But really, the problem, like a lot of these things, comes down to the sort of cheap mass produced fish. It's like if you are at the seaside and you've watched the fishing boat come in and they put a red snapper on your plate, there's somewhere where they get that, and then you have that, that's, that's basically probably all right. But if you have cheap, highly processed fish, you know, in a fish finger from some completely unknowable source that's been designed to be as cheap as possible, it's not so great for the fish. That's where the problem is. So, so I think, and of course, there's, you have to be very careful about the risk of snobbery in this because being able to buy fresh red snapper is, is something that, you know, if, if 
people would, more people might choose that instead of fish fingers if they had the financial opportunity. You have to be careful. But I do think that, like a lot of these things, it's the mass production that hides where things come from that's the problem. And if we can be much more careful about that, then, you know, I mean, I would, if, if it was left to me, I, from the ocean's point of view, it could really do with being left alone. I think we could, we could, it, it's being overfished. Even when fishermen think that they are fishing to the quotas, the quotas are being shifted by lobbyists all the time. And the long-term damage is immense. And you have to, basically, once you've started pushing over that thing, you have to shut it down in order to give time to recover. So, and that is coming. It's coming whether people like it or not. So either you, you, you control it now and then there's some fishing industry in 10 years' time, or you, you know, you just, stocks collapse and collapse and collapse and collapse and there will just be no fish. And it really is that serious. Yeah, and in terms of like coming up with solutions to that problem and you say kind of leave areas alone and you can do these um, sort of exclusion zones and, and no catch zones, and those tend to come from uh, governments and, and sort of national organizations. Does that tool, like what does that tool need from scientists as far as getting to a good spot? So there's this idea of marine protected areas, which is what I think you're referring to. And there's this idea, a very laudable idea of 30 by 30, that we should protect 30% of the world's oceans, that they should be a marine protected area by 2030. And the problem with that is that the definition of marine protected area is really flexible. And people assume that what a marine protected area is means is you can't go fishing and you can't you know, dump things in it and you can't send big ships through. None of that is true. The proportion of marine protected areas for which that is true is down in the one to 2% mark. What generally happens is that there's a thing called a marine protected area, but there are lots of things are allowed and then they kind of push inwards. Um, and so th there might be some benefit, but it's not nearly as much as it sounds like. So really it's not a scientific problem, it's a political problem that if you have a marine protected area, it has to, it has to be a no-take area, it has to be a no-pollute area. And what you find is that then what you get is all the fishy vessels hang around just on the outside because it's so busy producing fish that kind of leak out into the environment. So, I mean, and you can see that two ways, that either they are actually getting more fish than they did because something in here is now producing them, or that they're then taking away the benefit because, and the problem is that then is enforcement. So these are political problems, you know, and there are systems, there's supposed to be a system, every, every ship, every boat large, larger than a certain size is supposed to have a beacon. It is supposed to be switched on all the time and people turn them off. And so that kind of enforcement, it, it, it's, the, it's those two things. It's, the, it's not giving in to lobbyists and it's enforcement of policies that will make marine protected areas really work. Yeah, and it sounds like what you were saying, even when there is a technological approach where you have these beacons, you have this system, it's not always going to be effective if there's not that sort of uh, enforcement aspect to it. The problem is the humans. <laughs> right. <laughs> but we, we're getting better at enforcement, right? Satellites and the AIS system, it is making a difference. It's just if we can do it better, it, it, I mean, you, you could theoretically get rid of these problems, probably with the technology you have in this building, if we could actually make them accessible and you know, in a way that people could use them for enforcement, and then you just got enough people on the ground to really make the enforcement work. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So we'll throw to audience <laughs> questions in just a minute. Um, but one last question for you, from me. Uh, you obviously understand um, the importance of the storytelling aspect of, and sort of public education aspect of science. What are the things that get people excited about the ocean? You mentioned pretty fish, but what else? And how did you sort of incorporate that into the book? So the things that interest people are the things that surprise them. And, and so sometimes there are things you think, you know, why would someone, so there's this, there's a thing I write about in the book that, you know, there's a, a load of, um, there's a particularly productive region of just down the side of South America, it produces loads and loads of fish because of the physics of what the ocean is doing. Um, people in the 50s and the 60s um, shipped vast amounts of it to Britain, took those fish out, ton, like billions of tons, millions of tons of them, brought them back to the UK, ground them as fish meal, fed them to pigs. And uh, because pigs need protein, and after World War II, the pig clubs weren't enough, so you had pigs fed them fish meal. Um, and of course, they fished out this current, population collapsed. Um, and the price of, this is in South America, massive fish population collapses in South America, the price of British bacon doubles overnight. And things like that, like people really like that, the idea that there are connections. And so I think a lot of it is, you know, people are really interested in ideas. They're interested in how their world works. 
And if you're creative and you're, you, you understand how to tell a story, the world is full of interesting things, like absolutely full of interesting things. I used to do a, um, I did a sort of advent, online advent calendar one year where I said to people, send me the most boring picture you can imagine on Twitter back when that was a thing. And, um, and, they, and I wrote a blog post and they, they did, and I was always something interesting. There's always a story in there. You've just got to trust the natural world and know how to look. And so that's, so it's, it's that, it's, I think it's, it's not, I mean, it was, some of these stories are kind of hiding in plain sight. That's why people don't see them. Some of them I had to go digging and, you know, years as a TV presenter helps with that digging. But fundamentally, the natural world is the most fascinating thing we have. And so of course there's a story. Um, you've just got to go looking for it, and that will keep people interested. What's an example of a most boring photo that you got from people? <laughs> I think a guy sent me a picture of, uh, in a, a, a completely concreted parking lot, the back of his car with the boot open. Um, and I think I wrote something about the, um, I can't remember what they're called, but those little hydraulic things that you know slow down the rise of the boots as it comes up and down, and the way that they work, and there's a history of how they work. And that was the thing I picked, that I remember. So there's always something in there that's got a story. That makes sense. Um, yes, we have time for some audience Q&A. So if you raise your hand, and then um, we'll repeat the question for the live stream and the recording. Do we have any audience questions here in the front? Yeah, so the question was, in uh, different areas of physics, are there interesting transferable skills to the area of ocean science? Uh, well, there are loads. So most ocean scientists don't train as ocean scientists. We're all started off as chemists or physicists or some, you know, mathematicians or something else. Um, but the, it, all of it's transferable. And actually, you've just reminded me of a conversation I had with, I'm going to have to tell her about this, um, with a researcher. So I went to see um, the research group at the National Oceanography Centre who study what is called marine snow. And so things that are living in the surface of the ocean, they kind of die and, and they poo a lot. And the poo gets, um, you know, sort of drifts down through the ocean. And, and it's important food for other things. It's an important source of carbon to the deep ocean. But, and it drifts very, very slowly. So they've got a whole research group that's studying um, all of, you know, this very slow drifting of very tiny bits of poo and other detritus. Um, and, and they've just got some new instrument, which is sort of a hologram thing. And you can, you can collect it in these big funnel things, but they've just got some kind of holographic camera that watches it fall and can, you can see all these little poos that are all attached together and they've got things growing on them. Anyway, she studies this, and so they, they just got this camera and they, they're looking at artificial uh, image recognition software to identify the type of poo from what some type of zooplankton up there. And, um, and she said to me, she's, and I'm pretty sure these are exact words, she said, the problem is there are loads of people, there are loads of clever people who could do this, but they all go and work at Google. <laughs> 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 um, so, and, and there is someone in the building, apparently, and down there who left Google to go and do image recognition on, on zooplankton poo. So <laughs> the path has been laid. Um, so, but, you know, the, so that's just one example, right, where you've got that kind of, there's, there, there is so much to do in the ocean that there isn't, a, you know, the money, that, there's money going into ocean research, but there's always more to study. You know, a lot of these new technologies will be very helpful, especially for, you know, Traditionally, subjects as science has been, especially ocean science, you've got the opportunity to go to one place and study one time of year, but what you really want is to see how it's changing over time. And that's where digital technology can make a big difference. Yeah, yeah so it sounds like there's plenty of places for Google engineers <laughs> in ocean science. Um, right here. The first question was basically, uh, what's your take on climate change? There's different views, sort of a nihilistic approach from young people who think it's all kind of gone to shit, and then there's sort of the optimistic view. Um, and then the second question was uh, a story about the moon. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so the, the fl on the climate change thing, I think there is a lot of there's evidence that we are now moving in the right direction than we haven't before. I think there was a, re a report last week that said the the decarbonisation of el the world's electricity supply is actually almost on track for 1.5 degrees C of warming. And so, I don't think it's the case that we should give up. And I think that the reason that they think that is partly because what adults say is, oh well, we caused a big problem. Here you go. Uh, and, and what they don't see is the enormous amount of work that's gone into already over decades, has al the enormous amount of thinking that has already been done, the groundwork has been laid. Um, and, and so they feel helpless because they are, you know, at an early stage of sort of mental development, really, and they're being presented with massive problems that are defeating governments and, you know, people who, who think about a lot of things. Um, 
And so, but I, I, it's absolutely not the case that we are past the point of no return. Every single, if we miss 1.5, the next goal is 1.51. And I think that the, the problem is that one of the problems for them is that the world is very complicated. And as we see with the rise of populism and whatever, when the world looks really complicated, what people want is a simple solution. They want a magic pill because it's just their brain can cope with it. And I think that's that that that's where that comes from. It's just I can't deal with all of this. I can't. It's too. I can't put a framework on it. And they're young and vulnerable and don't have, you know, they haven't got the maturity to to understand that even solving part of the problem is making a big difference. They look at this whole big thing and I can't. I can't deal with that. And so I think I think that's where it comes from. And and showing them tool, giving them agency, showing them what already exists, showing them that we are not starting from zero. All of those things start to shift that mentality, I think. And there's always going to be a few who, for other reasons, you know, to do with their uh, either their mental health or their the you know other you know the way they were brought up, are going to be down the hard end of all of that. But I think most people, if you give them a direction of travel and they feel that we're all on this together, they w they can get on board with it. And I think it's really important. And that's why you know talking about how the planet works is really important because it's then it's not just a shopping list. Oh, I have to remember to do all these things. You see how you interact with the world around you. And then you can s you don't have to remember what to do. You, you can intuitively understand what to do. And uh, yeah, so so I, I try and discourage nihilism. And then on the other, <laughs> the other question, um, one of uh, as part of one of my rants about why the ocean is much more interesting than the moon, I tell people about this worm, it's a polychaete worm. It lives so a sponge so we start with a sponge. So a sponge is an animal. Uh, it's it's a solid pretending to be an animal. It's mostly, yeah, it's it's mostly this kind of, you know, this big open structure that is what bath sponges originally came from. But some of it, a small proportion of it is alive, so it counts as an animal. Um, so it lives on the seafloor, and there's a type of worm that when it is a larvae, it kind of drifts around through the ocean and it settles with its head down the bottom of the sponge. And as it grows, it grows upwards. So its head stays down there and its tail grows up. And it grows through the holes, but it doesn't just grow through the holes. It, it branches and branches and branches and branches. And so all the tails split and then the, those new tails split and then the new tails split. And after a little while, when you look at the top of the sponge, when they've reached the surface, you're looking at a sponge and there are videos of this. And there's a thousand little anuses crawling around on the surface, kind of nosing around. And the worm is head still stuck down there. That's not the best bit. The best bit is that when it comes time to mate, this thing obviously has got a problem, right? It's not, dating apps are not going to help it. So, so what it does is, um, in order to, to sort of send it, you know, all the little anuses grow eyes and the digestive bits turn into gonads. So it takes some DNA and then they kind of break off and they swim off to the surface and they get on with the mating at the surface while the worm stays down the thing. Um, and then, you know, all the others do it at the same time. And then you've got new worms that go off to find new sponges. And this worm down here stays there um, having a good time. And after a while, it grows some new anuses and grows some new little stolons. That's what they're called. And they drift off. And you don't get that on the moon, right? <laughs> that one creature by itself is more to study in that than everything we've ever <laughs> learned about the moon. The moon's very nice. <laughs> yeah, that's asynchronous mating at scale. That's yeah. really impressive by this worm. Um, we have a question back here. Yeah, so the question is about the interaction sort of between rivers and dammed rivers that have started to dry up and the oceans that feed those rivers. So there's another, this is the saltwater side of the problem, right? The, the other side of the whole thing is the freshwater side. And there was an excellent book recently published by Tim Smedley called The Last Drop that covers freshwater mismanagement on land. And um, the problem with a lot of it is that we, we haven't really managed it very well <laughs> and that's putting it mildly and the problem with dams is that not only do they knock out you know a whole valley but then you have a whole load of water that then people use and become dependent on and then if the weather changes then you don't have as much water you know in Colorado there's ridiculous fights over who owns the Colorado River because these river rights were written for a different age and no one really wrote them properly and now they've all got different interpretations, which obviously mean that whichever, whoever, whoever's arguing has the most water. And so the Colorado River just isn't there anymore. And then you get these, these incursions in. And so um, the, the, there's a big 
that this is a freshwater problem and it's to do with our management of freshwater. And if you want to be made angry about the mismanagement of freshwater in this country, and I'm not even talking about the sewage, that's part of it. Um, Tim's book is really good for that. But we are mismanaging our reservoirs. We are wasting water. We're doing things like concreting over. So concrete, you know, concreted city is one of the worst things you can do for water management because what it means is that water that falls on the concrete slides off into the nearest drain and is then in very fast channels that, that are sort of forced to be channeled out to sea wherever they go as quickly as possible. Whereas what you want, if you want to retain water in the landscape, you need it to hit soil so it goes down and actually is held within the land. And if it's not held within the land, it will run out to sea and then it's salt water and you've lost your reserves on the land. And so, um, you know, there are starting to be things like porous concrete, which is designed to be permeable so that water can, you know, go down through it, get to the soil. And, uh, but, you know, so there are, even the way our cities are built, even the way our roads are built, damages freshwater management. And, and it's that, and so it's that kind of thing, right? There's a fun, there are a lot of, there are some easy wins, uh, collecting more rainwater, for example. Um, thinking about you know how much we flush things away as a default situation you know default really you know, way of solving a problem so so that that's a freshwater problem and there are a lot of you should we should all be very angry about the way freshwater is managed not just this in this country but in almost all of them but it came absolutely came from that thing that energy engineers were asked to optimize and they were asked to optimize this problem without any consideration of the system around it, and that's where the problem came from. Yeah, so the question is basically from a tech perspective, are there inspiring things related to uh, combating climate change and ocean science? I shall spare you the rant on what I think about um, carbon, uh, carbon, to carbon dioxide removal schemes by the ocean. Um, so, although for those in the room who don't know what those are, you know, there's a whole set of um, you know, the IPCC has said that in order to reach 1.5 by, or even 2 degrees by 2050, um, we'll need to find some way of taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And that's, even if we decarbonise as quickly as possible, there's still quite a lot left. Um, and we need to take it out, which is not, and none of this carbon dioxide removal is an excuse for burning more fossil fuels. It is very, very clear that offsets are not, like I think we should be talking about zero, not net zero. We aim for zero, we miss off and you know carbon uh, carbon dioxide removal might take up the difference anyway so people are looking at the ocean to uh, they're saying well it's very big it has contains lots of carbon anyway might as well put some more in it um, and the so there are a huge number of schemes ocean alkalinity enhancement is one uh, sinking seaweed uh, there's a you know a whole range of things of varying practicality should we say um, and the thing that they all have in common is that they assume they can scale up. And the problem that they have is, first of all, we don't have the science to show that they'll even work because the ocean moves. It's not like you plant a tree and then you bugger off. You know, you come back in 20 years, is your tree still there? You're good, right? In the ocean, you take some, they're all based on the idea that you take some carbon out of the upper ocean, um, put it somewhere, and then more ca and carbon from the atmosphere will just get absorbed by the ocean to kind of re-equilibrate that's that's and and for that to happen your bit of water that you've taken some carbon out of has to stay near the surface and it has to not you know it it has to not mix into everything else it has to actually take some carbon in and not give it back and in order to track all of that um you know it's we, we don't have the science to do it and it, at the moment it looks like none of these methods are going to work that is not what the company is doing them will tell you so when it comes to tech fixes uh, for that particular one, actually the game is, is this thing called monitoring, reporting and verification, which is tracking whether or not they work. And I think those are the tech solutions which, which have promises. We need tools that can hold people accountable for the, thing, for the claims they are making. And we know now, it's been very clearly demonstrated that most offsets are not worth the paper they're written on because they made claims in the limited area that did not take into consideration the wider area. But it's got to be open, it's got to be transparent, it's got to be accessible to everybody, and it's not got to be funded by the people who get the certificates or whatever comes out of it. And I think and that, I think that principle applies to a lot of things, that, that really the, the, the tech part of it is how do you... It's the tools. It's the tools to hold people to account. Because the, the risk that we have in the situation we're in is that People understand there are problems. Someone comes along and says, oh, here's my, you know, I'm going to sell you a solution to your problem. Here you go. How do you check? 
Like the, the reason you ask them is that you're not an expert in that thing. How do you know whether they're trustworthy? How do governments know who's trustworthy? Um, and a lot of these companies are just in it because they want to make a quick buck, sell the IP and clear off. And so I think that those, those are going to be the most important tech solutions. It's openness and transparency and tools for accountability in, within these complicated systems. And that's, that, you know, that's going to be a big deal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's all the time we have. Helen, thank you so much again for being here. This has been fantastic having you.